The Old Testament reading for this morning is Deuteronomy from the seventh chapter. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all people. But because the Lord loves you and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of the Pharaoh king of Egypt. Therefore know that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle lesson is from 1 Corinthians, the second chapter. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech of, or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words or wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit of power that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Yet among the mature, we do not impart wisdom, although it is not a wisdom of this age or in the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away. But we impart a secret wisdom of God, which God decreed before ages of our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, no ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him, these things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything, even the depths of God. For who knows a person's thought except the spirit of that person which is in him? So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand these things freely given to us by God. This is the word of the Lord. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. Gospel is taken from Matthew 5 which uh, we mentioned last week is the Sermon on the Mount. So Jesus continues with his teaching um, to that large crowd. <clears throat> Jesus said to them, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, and nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but they put it on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless... Your righteousness exceeds that of all the scribes and Pharisees. You will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is the gospel of our Lord. We confess our Christian faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, 
God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And on the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven. And it sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated, and I'd like to invite the children up for a children's message. Come on up. Oh, you made that? That's beautiful. Good job. All right. Well, you can sit right next to me right there. How's that? There you go. We wouldn't leave you out. Okay. All right. Last week we talked about how much God loves us. Um, this week I brought some paper, and I want you to tell me how much your mom loves you. Okay. But wait a minute. Do I need a little piece of paper to write down how much your mom loves you, or a medium-sized piece of paper, or is it going to take a huge piece of paper? I think like a medium-sized paper. <laughs> <laughs> you working on that, Mom, right? A huge one, right? Because if we start to think about all the things that mom does for us, it would take up a big piece of paper, right? And do you love your mom? Sure you do. And she does all those wonderful things for you. But, but, when you get older, is your mom going to have to feed you? No. no. Is she going to have to um, help you with your homework? No. Is she going to have to make your bed? No. no. That shouldn't be happening right now. That's right. That's right. But, but when you get older and mom's not doing those things, are you still going to love her? Yes. Why? Because she's part of your family. Okay, because she's part of your family. You can remember them, right, as if she's not doing them anymore, you know. But it's true. We don't love our moms and dads because of this list of things we, they do. We love them because of who they are, right. They're a special person that God put into our lives, and we love them because of who they are. Um, it's wonderful that they do things for us, but that's not why we love them. We most of all, because that's our mom or our dad, right? Yeah. Okay, let's, let me say a prayer, and then I'll give you um, some lollipops to go back. I want to say a prayer with me this morning. Okay, so repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for my mom. Thank you for my dad. But most of all, thank you for Jesus. Amen. Oh, good job. All right, same old, same old lollipops. And thank you for coming up. Okay, make sure you check with mom and dad who love you whether you can eat it first, all right? Kids are the most honest Christians we have. 
right? <laughs> Why? Why did God allow 140 Christians, including 80 women and children, to be bombed to death while they were worshiping the Lord at All Saints Church in Pakistan? Why have thousands of Syrian Christians lost their homes and been displaced and now suffer living in tents in refugee camps? As the drive-by gangster sprayed his bullets at his target, why did the little six-year-old girl get hit instead? Or on the positive side, why were you and I born in America, a land of freedom and prosperity and opportunity, while millions of others around the world are born in nations filled with starvation and disease and violence. Why? Why questions are the most difficult in life? What and how and where, those questions deal with just stating realities, just stating the truth. Why questions cause us to go into motive, purpose, seek an explanation. Over the years, when people have come into my office and shared their trials and difficulties, the word that troubles them the most is why. Why did God allow this painful disaster to enter into my life? And for believers, that little word why often becomes a faith issue. And it's a troubling little word for pastors and theologians. Why did God let Adam and Eve fall into sin? The book of Job is about one believer's struggle, 42 chapters, struggling with that little word, why? Uh, We have worship services on Wednesday night in Lent coming up soon, um, 7 o'clock on Wednesday nights, and I'm, I'm putting together to follow up from this, um, a little series on the book of Job for our Wednesday night services about how Job went through and wrestled with uh, those questions. But why is also a very powerful word. Why is the word of invention and exploration? Why is the word of the visionary? Why is the word of life's greatest discoveries? Why have I and why have you been given a a sound mind and relatively healthy body? When I was serving in Maryland, a member of our congregation asked me if I'd go visit a friend of hers. Her friend lived in an old, small, single-wide trailer, and when I went in, the main room space was filled with a hospital bed. And on the bed was a man, uh, more an adult child, in his 40s, he was basically just a head and a small chest, no arms, almost no lower body, a couple of tiny lifeless legs. His name was Georgie. He was about 10 or 12 mentally, but alert and aware. He could hear you. He could understand a little bit, but he couldn't speak, couldn't move himself in any way. In one of the bedrooms in the back of the trailer was Georgie's sister. She also was an adult in her 40s. She also was bedridden. She also was severely and mentally challenged. The other bedroom belonged to Georgie's older sister. That was the friend that I was asked to visit with. She was not challenged physically or mentally. Her challenge was as a 24-hour 365 day a year, year after year after year caregiver for her two siblings. She did that with tremendous patience and love and a willing sacrifice over the years. But in order for her to be able to do that for her brother and sister, Years ago, she had to stop asking herself, why? 
Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we are so blessed. We are so incredibly blessed. We are so, so blessed in so many ways, so blessed to be a Christian, so blessed to live in this nation, so blessed to have family and friends, so blessed to have a voice to sing Your praise, so blessed to be able to worship and serve You. We are so, so blessed. And sometimes we wonder, we wonder why. Amen. You know, last week we talked about how much God loves us. Does God love us? Does He? Somebody say amen. So we talked about, that's a fact. We talked about facts that show that God loves us. But why? That's an especially tough question, and especially when you make it personal. Like, why does God love me? I know that. God loves me. Jesus loves me. This I know. I know how God loves me. That's what we talked about last week. I know how much God loves me. Greater love has no one than to lay down his life for his friends. And God loved me enough to leave the glory of heaven. And God loved me so much he allowed his own son to die for me on the cross. But sometimes it blows me away to think about why God loves me. I know what I'm like. Every single day I sin against Him. Why does this perfectly holy, almighty God bother to actually love me? Now, since the why questions of life are so difficult for us, to most why questions we've come up with a rather simple answer. Because. Because. Ask your little one, why did you paint the kitchen floor in magic marker? Because. Why do both of the toddlers want to play with the same toys at the exact same time? Because. And you know, we can even use that word because to answer the big questions in life. Why do you have the career that you have right now and where you are working? Because, because it just sort of turned out that way, didn't it? This is what I do. This is how I'm living my life. Because, no great rational reason. Pascal, the brilliant mathematician, an incredible mind and a powerful faith in God, who has been hated for years by Pastor Tom for inventing calculus. Pascal, the, the brilliant, logical genius, wrote this. He said, the heart often has its reasons that the reason will never know. Now, I'm not anti-intellectual. Uh, and, and a lot of stuff related to our faith, though, is just like that that it often has reasons that the reason will never know, only the heart. Do you remember years ago, this, I don't remember how many years, um, if you're young, you may not even remember it, but there was an ice storm in, in Washington, D.C., and an ice-covered plane crashed, went off the runway, and landed in the Potomac River um, next to uh, National Airport there. And a man named Lenny Skudnik was driving by. He stopped his car and he ran to the river's edge and Lenny plunged into the deadly freezing Potomac River and he began swimming back and forth, dragging others to safety at tremendous risk to his own life. And afterwards, the reporters all surrounded him and asked him, why did he do it? All he could say was, because... Larry, you've got this lovely wife and children at home. Larry, you know, um, most of those in the water are probably already succumbed to the cold. You're no great sinner. Why did you do it, Larry? Just because. Pascal would say that this way, that the heart has its reason, that the reason will 
Never know. But surely the answer for why God loves you and me must be in the Bible, right? Say right. Okay. It's in our text this morning from Deuteronomy 7. Speaking for God, Moses says to the people, why does God love you? Is it because you are more numerous than the other people? You are more powerful? You are more special? No. He says, the Lord has chosen you. The Lord loves you because. Because He loves you. Now, I could make a a list of reasons why I love my wife. Things like she's fun to be with. She's a great cook. She feeds me. Uh, She's easy to talk to. She cares for my children. She prays for me. But you know what? Almost everything on that list someone else could do. Almost everything. Cook and feed me, talk to me. I could even get someone to care for the children. Pray for me? Sure. But even if someone else was doing those things... I wouldn't feel the same way about it because loving Gwen is something that comes not from my reason or my intellect, but something that lives in my heart. It's become a part of who I am. Same is true with my children. I will always love them. Why? Because. Because loving them has become a part of who I am. Why? Just because. There's a kind of divine, cosmic, illogical aspect to God's unconditional love for you and for me. We are not that lovable. We don't do anything for God that God really needs. God did not have to create us and give us life. You can't make a logical, you can't make a reasonable case for why God loves us. God loves us Because. Because it's a part of who God is, right? Scripture says God is love. Now, here's the point. Wait, if if you were asleep for the first 10 minutes, here's the point, all right? There is a lot of comfort in the truth that God loves us just because. Just because God is love. You see, If God loved you or me for a reason, we would have to constantly prove that we satisfied that reason. For example, if God loved me based on how much I loved Him, I'd constantly have to struggle to make sure I loved Him enough. God loves me because, because God loves me. Moses said to God's people, God loves you just because, because God loves you. Now, a theologian could say, God loves us because of Jesus, right? Because of what Jesus did by dying and taking away our sin on the cross. Is that true? Yes, it is. But did God have to send Jesus? No. It says God so loved the world that He sent His Son to die for us. Why did God send Jesus? Because. Because God loves us. Consider for a moment some of the people that God has loved with an undying, unconditional love. Moses, a murderer, sassed back to God all the time, resisted God's will for his life. God loved him. David, an adulterer and a murderer who shamed the name of God in Israel. God loved him. Peter, a blasphemer and a traitor. God what? Loved him. The rebellious, sinful, idol-worshiping, fickle children of Israel, God loved them. Paul, a violent, murderous, religious bigot, God loved him. The ten disciples who ran away and let Jesus die on Good Friday, God loved them. These are the people we see God loving with a deep, permanent love. 
unworthy sinners, liars, deceivers, adulterers, murderers, gossips, prostitutes, tax collectors, cheaters, bigots, and godless people. Just like you and me. There's no reason God should have loved them and there's no reason that God should love us. And this is the kind of unconditional love from God that inspires you and me to serve and love God with an abandon that we can never truly explain to the reason of the world around us. It seems so unreasonable to the world, doesn't it? that you and I live our lives to serve other people and to sacrifice for Jesus. But our heart has reasons that the reason around us will never know. There was a young man who sat in a uh, class at a liberal seminary. The professor was saying that um, we don't need missionaries anymore. Uh, because all religions lead to God. But as the professor lectured, this young man named Rick said he was overwhelmed with the thought of how much God loves him. He said, I had such peace and assurance that, that God loves me. So Rick quit school, though he was close to graduating. He ran off to join a mission agency in India to tell the people there that God loved them. Just after arriving in India, he got hepatitis and nearly died. He recovered, and after many difficult years, he developed a a powerful Christian witness in India. So he came to speak at a church back home, and the pastor said to him, Rick, why do you love the Indian people so much? Why would you give up your degree and your home and all those things that you've given up? Why have you risked your very health and your very life? And you know what Rick said? What? Because. He said what, Mo, what God said through Moses as to why he loved the nation of Israel. He said what Jesus would say when asked why he would go through the agony of the cross. Because he loves us. We love because he first loved us. God is love and God is the great because. In Genesis, Adam and Eve were disobedient, sin, and hid from God. Why did God go looking for them? Because. In the Old Testament, God's people continually disobeyed Him, turned their backs. They actually spent time worshiping other gods. Yet God kept sending the prophets to call them back to Him. Why? Because. As a pastor, my life revolves around telling people that God loves them. That's my joy. That's my purpose. And I love being able to answer their questions and explain things on a deep theological level. But sometimes it all comes down to because. God loves us because. Because God loves us. That's who God is. That's what God does. And for wretched, selfish sinners, for you and me, that's the best reason of all. God loves us just because. Amen? Thank you. Lord, there is such great comfort in knowing that we are loved because you are love. That, that the love that embraces us, the love that forgives us, the love that is present with us every day in the Holy Spirit, the love that awaits us in heaven is our possession, not a single iota, not a dot or tittle because of who we are or what we have done, but only because you are a gracious, merciful God of unfailing forgiveness and love. And that's why we gather to worship your holy name and to bless your name. And that's why we have thankfulness in our hearts even when we can't understand the whys of what's going on around us. Because you are our God, and you have declared 
that we are loved. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, we'll collect our offerings of love to the Lord this morning. It's a good opportunity to remind us that our offerings are offerings of our love to God, not to St. John's, not to the mortgage, not to whatever else is needed in the congregation. When we give, when we give our offerings on Sunday morning, we're giving to the Lord. And there are our offerings of love to Him. So, thank you. 